Hi, and welcome to another episode of Piano TV. So for today's tutorial on how to read a lead sheet and what that even is, we are going to be building on some of the chord information that we've learned up to now. So if you're not like caught up on your major and minor chords and your seven chords and all that, definitely go in the description bar and check out, like I left all the links to the videos we've done on that so far, because we're not gonna talk about that too much today, but it's an important part of how to, how to do what we're doing here. There are a couple sheets that go along with this video that I'll also leave below. So there's a PDF on how to build like a major and minor scale in every key. And that's really useful when you're figuring how to build chords. And then there's also going to be the sheet of the piece we're looking at today, which is You Can't Take That Away From Me by George and Ira Gershwin. So let's get started. <laughs> So what is a lead sheet? First of all, I just wanted to show you what they look like because you've probably even seen them before. Generally, the style of the sheet music is kind of handwritten, a little bit scrawly, even if you make them on the computer. So oftentimes these lead sheets are put in books that are called fake books or real books, which I realize is very confusing. So let's talk about that. So fake books and real books are basically the same thing. Actually, they're entirely the same thing. They're collections of jazz standards in like the most bare bones style possible. All you really have is a melody. Sometimes you get lyrics if you're lucky. I didn't do lyrics for this arrangement. I hope you'll forgive me. And then sometimes, well not sometimes, you'll always get the chord symbols as well. So just like a really loose template of how to play a song and it's usually associated with jazz music. So the difference between why they're called a fake book and a real book, I actually think it's just a joke. Like, cause the fake book came first and then real books came later so they were probably just like ah we're gonna call this the real book and it's gonna be funny because it's based on the fake book but the fake book was called as such because it literally allowed the performer to fake it you have this sheet of music with all the bare bones information you need to play a song and then they could just kind of like wing it and improvise so bear with me for a minute because i want to make an analogy and i think it'll be useful although it's going to take a little bit of time to get to the point i think so most of us have like a granny or a mom or, you know, someone we know in our life who uses recipe cards, you know, those like tiny little things like stashed away in like a, a box in someone's kitchen. So nowadays, a lot of us don't use recipe cards, like maybe granny still does, but there's the internet, right? And you can like Google anything and get a recipe for anything and you get like a million details. Whereas recipe cards, you have to make yourself and they don't have a lot of information. So when you use them, you kind of have to know what you're doing. So for starters, the internet recipe is going to tell you like every minuscule detail. There's gonna be dozens of photos sometimes and they're gonna, instead of just saying like one cup of flour, it might say like one cup organic, unbleached, 100% Saskatchewan pure farm raised flour. So it's like, okay, that's cool, but like, on grandma's recipe card, you're just getting flour because there's not room for like all that extra stuff. So internet recipes have just like so much more padding. So granny's recipe card just has like exactly the essentials. Cause like I said, there's no room for like all that extra fluff. So it's up to you, the chef to figure out all the details in between. So to me, that's the difference between a lead sheet and see, this is where I was going with it, and actual like fully written sheet music. So you might have sheet music that has every single note written in. So even, even if you've never heard the song before, if you diligently practice and read the rhythm correctly and everything, what you end up playing should sound like a pretty nice arrangement of the song and someone should be able to recognize it. With a lead sheet though, you're just given the template. So if you don't know what it's supposed to sound like, you might be in trouble because it's up to you, the performer, to kind of invent the details yourself. So it would be like if granny had a recipe in a recipe card box that was called cookies. All right. So if you've never had granny's cookie recipe, you might be like, okay, I have no idea what to expect from this. I don't know what to do. Like what kind of cookies are these? Are they crunchy? Are they soft? Are they chewy? Are they airy? I don't know. But if you've eaten the cookies before, you know what to expect. Like maybe they're chocolate chip cookies and they're nice and like chewy and they spread really well in the oven. And you, you have like a mental map of what it's supposed to be like. It's the same with the lead sheet. Without that mental map of what the song is supposed to end up coming out like, it's gonna be kind of difficult to improvise your way there. So to me, that's the difference between a lead sheet and like fully written sheet music. It's like a recipe card and a full recipe. And also, by the way, the secret to perfect chocolate chip cookies is to slightly underbake them. I'm not just saying that. Fun fact, I went to culinary school. 
The thing that I like about lead sheets is really nice about them is if you know what you're doing and how to interpret them and you have a little bit of like improvisation skills and stuff that you've developed is you don't need all of those extra notes. It's like you could you could have like an eight page version of the same song with all the notes written in, but with a lead sheet, it's just one page, no frills, really easy to read. So it's super convenient in that way. And it does take a little bit of time to learn how to read chords quickly and efficiently, but I do think it's a really useful skill to have. So the song that we're gonna learn today by Gershwin is called They Can't Take That Away From Me. And there's a few reasons I picked that one. I mean, one of the biggest reasons is that it's a song that a lot of people know. I mean, if you don't think you'll know it from the title, you might've heard it before. But it's also like a nice gentle tempo. It's not too fast. It's not super slow either. So it's pretty manageable if you've never attempted to read a lead sheet before. And I also like that it doesn't have like a whole bunch of wild chords. Like you're not gonna see like diminished ninth whatever flat five type chords so that makes it more manageable too going back to the cookie analogy though you need to listen to this piece before you attempt to interpret it so i left a link in the description below there's gonna be like a ton of links there but work with me it's the the version that i really like of this song is by ella fitzgerald and louis armstrong and i actually kind of based my arrangement on that song they're both in the same key the key of b flat major so you could even like play that audio track and play along with the piano and it should all sync up well. So here's our sheet music that we're gonna be working on. Since we've already covered chords more in depth in other videos, we'll just briefly touch on them here. I don't wanna to spend too much time again. Like I said, you can kinda of check below in the description if you missed those videos and you're confused about what I'm doing. So just a brief overview. If you have just the letter name and nothing else, assume it's a major chord. If you have a little circle like this, that's gonna be a diminished chord. The M, the lowercase m, represents a minor chord, so this would be a C minor seven. And just like we did in the previous video, the sus4 means suspended four. We looked at that. Again, I'll link it all below. Then we've got the melody. So this is like the part you would sing, even though there's no lyrics in the sheet music version. So a jazz singer would only use this melody as a general guideline. They'd be pretty comfortable playing with the rhythm and changing the notes as they sing. So if you're not gonna be actually physically singing along, you can just adopt the same sort of like loose adaptation strategy on the piano. There's no need to stubbornly play this exactly with the rhythm that I wrote it in. As long as the melody still has flow and you're following like the basic rules of rhythm, you know, keeping everything in 4-4 time, not like distorting the beat too much, definitely I recommend going outside the lines because the way I wrote this rhythm was in a pretty simplistic way. And when you listen to any sung version of this, there's gonna be a lot more like variation in the rhythm, but I didn't want to add like a bunch of 16th notes and ties and stuff. So definitely feel free to play with it. Generally, I find there are two directions you can go using a lead sheet. So first of all, you can use the piano as pure accompaniment, like just doing the chords and the bass, and then you can actually sing the melody while you play piano. Or if that's not up to, you know, if that's not your thing, you could always do all the piano accompaniment while someone else sings over top of it, if you have like a friend who sings or whatever. So that's one thing you can do with the sheet music. The second thing you can do, if you wanna just like have a piano only show and you're not, down with singing or anything like that, is you can play the accompaniment, so like the bass and the chords in the left hand, so that would be like those things, and then this part here you could play with the right hand. And you could fill in some of these single melody notes with harmonies as well. If you're gonna sing the melody, you have a lot more freedom on the piano. To keep it simple, you could just play the bass notes in the left hand and fill out the chords in the right. So the bass notes are gonna be the letter names of the chords. It's a, if it's a B flat chord, you play a B flat in the left hand. D flat diminished, C minor seven, F sus four. So whatever the letter name is, you can see that I'm kind of playing that in the left hand. In the right hand, I'm playing the full chord. And sometimes when we have four note chords, like I could play an F minor seven like this and then play the F in the left hand too. But a simpler way to do that would be to take the F you're already playing it in the left hand anyway, and then just playing the top three notes of the F minor seven chord. It makes it a little bit easier when you get to parts like that, or C minor seven, I could do that instead of you know playing all four notes in the right hand, just simplifies things a little. And don't feel like you can't step outside of these notes either. I mean, nothing about this sheet is gonna be law. So sure, if your chord is F minor seven, there's those four specific notes in the chord, but you can manipulate it a bit, maybe by doing like a quick pass through other keys to add depth and texture, and that's totally fine. Like it still sounds like an F 
minor seven, but you're just decorating it a little bit. And that, that's almost, I don't want to say that's mandatory, but that'll make a really big difference when you're arranging something. I want to take a second to talk about comping. Comping is what you call playing the chords more than once to create rhythmic texture. So instead of just playing the song like this and pressing the chord, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, one, two. Instead of just playing the accompaniment like that, we add a little bit more to it. We add a little bit of rhythm. So maybe instead of doing like this and hold for four, I might go like. That a very, very simple pattern. And I find comping is something that you really just have to do in, to, to start getting a feel for it. When you first start doing it and you've never done it before, it can be really, really awkward. You might feel really stiff when you do it, but as you get used to different hand movements, it gets a little bit easier. And one way I like to practice this is actually, I'm spoiled because I have an electric piano and I have all these like drum presets and stuff, but playing with like an actual drum, like I'm, I just have like a jazz beat on here, can be really helpful when you're learning how to comp, right? Because you can hear where the beats are. And you can tell when you've fallen off the wagon. So I find that really useful. And even if you don't have an electric piano, if you're like, you know, have the traditional piano, there's still lots of like drum loops and stuff you can just kind of find for free online. Super, super useful when you're learning to comp. And there's no, aside from like sticking to the time signature and stuff, there's no rules for comping. It's not like you have to do it the way I just did it. You can do it. There's so many different ways to do it. And it's all just about filling an empty space. And that's going to change depending on what the song is. I'm just going to play a little bit of the song the way I might improvise it if I was doing like full piano accompaniments and was maybe singing along. A nice slow tempo, uh, tempo, tempo. <laughs> I like this pretty relaxed sounding. Da, 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 da. The other way to play this is by getting the right hand to play the melody because maybe you're not a singer or whatever. So the easiest way to start that is to only play the bass note in the left hand and like no chords or anything. And that gives you a chance to get a sense of the rhythm while figuring out the melody. I, I tend to like building songs in layers. So like starting from the simplest, most basic pieces like bass and melody before filling in the chords and harmonies. So I might do something like this when I start. with a bit of rhythm. And then the song really starts to take shape before you even go and add those details. And it's just a good way to get your hands like coordinated because if you if you start too difficult, sometimes, I don't know, sometimes that can be a bummer because then you're just like constantly struggling from the get-go. But if you're building in layers, it's always doable. So the next step then is to fill in more of the chords instead of just doing the bass note. My left hand's gonna be doing like some bass stuff, but also some chords to fill in the blank. So I'm gonna move up my, my right hand's gonna play an octave higher just so my left hand has more room. I don't know about you, but chords like down there just sound pretty awful. So, and I, I guess there's a time and a place for everything, but. So the nice thing about this song is it has lots of breaks from the melody, like long whole notes, which is gonna be the perfect opportunity to add like little fills. I'll show you what I mean. So we're just gonna start like this with a bass note. And then I got that long whole note. I can't talk and play at the same time. But you see what I did there? I took the part when my right hand was taking a break. I took that as an opportunity to get some left hand stuff going. So it's not quite so much multitasking. I'm just, I'm just gonna make something up here. really simple. All I did was add like a couple little chord decorations, but overall I was still basically doing like my right hand melody, my left hand chord situation or my left hand bass thing. So it wasn't too much of a step up and you can kind of keep adding like that until you get to a point where you're happy with it. And don't forget too, you can always add some harmony inside the melody. So instead of just doing single notes, stuff like this, you could um, add a little bit of depth by doing something like, like this. Just by 
decorating the right hand. And then when you put that together, let's just see what happens. And there you have it. So everything is going to be like mass linked in the description bar below. You can also go visit the blog and get all this information too. So mainly, you can print off the PDF of this piece if you want to work on it and practice your comping and do all that fun stuff. There's also that scale sheet if you want to have an easy way to figure out chords and build them yourself. And that's good too if you don't want to just like keep Googling all the chords and then you never really learn anything. I find it's useful to like train yourself to build them because that's how you start to internalize what the chords actually are. I'm going on a tangent. I'm just trying to say goodbye. Thank you for watching this video. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you next time. And <coughs> wow, I keep choking on my own spit. <laughs>